Hey everyone, and welcome to Game Dive, the podcast where we discuss one game each episode. This week's topic is going to be Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, I'm Perry, and joining me as always is Cam. Hey guys. Mark. Hello. And Evan. Hey. Um, So Shadow of the Colossus is the PlayStation-exclusive third-person adventure game developed by Sony Interactive Entertainment Japan Studio and also Team Eco, uh, which was the same studio that created Eco and The Last Guardian. Uh, which are two games of, of a similar style and aesthetic to Shadow of the Classes, I would say. Um, so Shadow of the Classes was originally released for the PlayStation 2 in October of 2005 in Japan and North America. Uh, it's also been remastered twice, once for the PlayStation 3 and once for the PlayStation 4. Um, so just to give, I guess, a little brief overview of what the game is, um, you play as an adventurer or swordsman named Wander, who has entered the Forbidden Land in order to resurrect his female companion, Mono. Uh, it's never stated what their relationship is or how Mono died or, or really anything about how they came to be here. Um, but once they get there, uh, Wander strikes a deal with a, an enigmatic spirit named Dorman, who promises to bring Mono back to life. Uh, But in return, he must defeat 16 giant beasts known as Colossi that have been scattered throughout the Forbidden Lands. Uh, So most of the game revolves around taking your horse through this vast abandoned land to find each of the different Colossi to slay. Um, You usually have to climb onto them in order to defeat them, and this typically requires you to trick them somehow or get them to do something that kind of compromises them uh, and, and so you can get on them. Uh, and so the game becomes somewhat puzzle-like in that way. Um, the Colossi are quite varied in their shape. Some of them are humanoids that wield weapons, and some take the shape of animals, like an eel or a bird or a gecko. Uh, it's a simple premise with a tight focus, and most people probably finish this game in around five to six hours on the first playthrough. Um, so for context, we've all been playing the PlayStation 4 remaster, so that's kind of what we're the the lens we're looking at it through uh i know cam and i have played the original playstation 2 edition uh, several years ago but it is evan and mark's first time playing through it these past couple of weeks so i'm sure they've got some uh, hot takes lined up <laughs> uh, and just a quick note this will be a spoiler heavy discussion just so you're aware uh and anyway i think we'll just get right into it um why don't we start off with evan if you want to give us uh, some thoughts on the gameplay all right. Well, I think that the game itself really the the best aspects of it are not the gameplay. The presentation and the narrative are the strong points whereas the gameplay throughout the game often feels like a just a means to an end where you're just sort of doing the motions to get through the story or to get through the goals required. Uh there are moments that are engaging and, and interesting and unexpected in some cases, but I think overall the game itself in terms of gameplay is relatively shallow. And just to clarify what there is to interact with, there is traversal either by horse or foot, uh, combat or puzzle elements, and climbing. And that's essentially it. So starting with traversal, I think it's incredibly simple with no clear depth to it, which is not necessarily a negative thing. It sort of evokes atmosphere traveling through the overworld that's so vast and and in the remaster in particular, beautiful and uh, empty. But it's essentially just point A to point B. You follow the light that's emitted from your sword and once you get to the end goal which is one of the colossus or colossi then (laughs) you fight it defeat it get teleported back to the home base you don't have to retread any of your path and repeat yeah i think that that is the pretty basic loop there and yeah it it is as you say simple but i think it is as simple as as it needed to be uh, I think if you added any additional systems or uh, anything like that, or even removed anything that's there, that it would feel less complete. Um, I mean, definitely being teleported back to the Shrine of Worship, uh, I think is is a pretty smart call there. Uh, if you imagine 
that the game was just one Colossus fight to the next with no like downtime in between, I think you definitely lose a lot of the, the, the atmosphere um, just from riding your horse from, from each point and kind of exploring the abandoned land. Well, for me, I think that it's more that there wasn't anything engaging about the uh, traversal in getting to the Colossus that, you know, it's aside from inconveniences due to the camera and, or due to uh, following the essentially what's a way marker, waypoint, and going where you weren't supposed to and then having to backtrack through that, which is grueling if it ever does happen. There, there isn't much to it. It's sort of just, you know, you're basically on autopilot. You, even the uh, riding aggro, your horse himself, it's sort of, you know, <laughs> aggro has the wheel and you're just there for the ride. Uh, <laughs> so I think there, it, it probably feels like it's a good thing that you just get teleported back to home base, essentially, because there's nothing engaging about the traversal in the first place. There's nothing to see or do aside from just get from the temple to colossus i'd say the only time backtracking is really valuable is in games with like a metroidvania style where there could be possibly new paths opened up by new tools that you've gained throughout your experience in the game where in this one i think it's definitely a good time saver repair you mentioned that not only does it service as kind of a a lull in action where you can kind of you know you're not always at the heights of climbing or discovering giant colossi is you kind of have to bring the level down so the highs can be as high as they are. You know, you need the low to to balance it out as some sort of juxtaposed uh, gameplay. That's true, but I just find that the lows, you know, lows can still have elements to interact with and and some amount of depth to themselves. So, you know, it's it doesn't have to be uh, crazy fights or complex puzzles or uh, you know. Uh, tiring sort of climbing or traversal that you have you have to repeat over and over just to get from uh different points but that's true but yeah no just something that engages me that makes me want to actually travel through the world aside from just getting to where i'm trying to go but the opposite side of that for me is i don't i appreciate that this game doesn't have any artificial game lengtheners or bullshit like side quests that I have to do before progressing. I do appreciate that. Okay, I did that. Now, what am I doing? All oh, right, I'm going back right back to find another Colossus. <laughs> and it, I, I kind of like that, how you're always doing stuff that feels important. If you had to go around and like suddenly gather herbs and like, you know, shove them down <laughs> your dead girlfriend's throat or something, <laughs> hoping that he was going to heal her or something like that, or yeah, try to look I'm for like bugs. Upgrade for your sword for plus one damage. <laughs> oh, exactly. So I, I think that would definitely detract from the game. And I think Perry mentioned that you can get through this game in like five to six hours. And I think there's something beautiful in that, in that quick runtime. Yeah, I think for me, what it comes down to is almost just a, it, you almost can't knock the game for it because it's doing the sort of what it's doing very specifically it's all it is is uh do the colossus that it doesn't give any more stuff to do it doesn't give anything else to interact with that's the goal of the game is to just knock down one colossus after the other and so i think for me it almost is more just i felt like i wanted more to engage with in between that because right. as it is to me it just sort of felt like the overworld was a giant level select screen, right? Where you'd beat one Colossus, and then instead of you know picking the next level, you just ride aggro to the next location. And then you jump through the painting to Bob on Battlefield. Exactly. <laughs> so, there. so yeah, that's I mean, effectively all the overworld. The hub world. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, as, I guess, boring as riding the horse can be, I think it definitely does a lot to set the atmosphere and the tone of, of the game and, and the world that you're traveling through. Of course. Um, which is definitely one, one of the strengths. And I think you'll find that most of the, the, I guess, weaknesses this game has were deliberate design choices, whether that makes it you know, excusable or not, um, definitely, you know, it was their intention for you to have these these uh, these long travel times where you kind of, I guess, just have to take in the scenery or 
or reflect or, or whatever the case is. I mean, it's I mean, also possible that it was to mask load times, which wouldn't be surprising considering having to load in the arenas and the Colossi, and Colossi themselves. In that case, you know, it's hard to blame the developers to, uh, for extending the, the uh, length you have to travel or through, you know, small passes and all that. Well, I mean, again, I, I feel like if you cut down on really the, the amount of time it takes for you to go from one, like if you imagine a hub world the size of Princess Peach's castle, like in <laughs> Mario Party, or sorry, Mario 64, you know, there, there's not much in between playing the game. And, yeah. and that works there for different reasons to set the tone that they were going for there. Um, but I think it, it works really well here uh, just to complement the, the atmosphere of the world. I think the other thing is, too, is that the game essentially has quest markers. You know, it's not as, uh, as they are these days where it's just a map icon yeah. or an icon on a uh, compass somewhere. But, there, you know, I also found myself, it's like you're not exploring the world either. It's literally just follow the line, follow the light. And unless you go the wrong way, you're not exploring at all. Which, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's probably intentional, but true. I'd argue by the end of the game, when you pull up the, the map at the end and it marks all the locations of the Colossi, the, the map doesn't actually feel that big by the end when you think about, okay, like, could I squeeze a Colossus fight in between, hmm. like, you know, those two Colossi locations? It does feel like it's a decent use of space, especially when you consider, I know they've, they've they reduced the map down from what they originally thought to, but they originally planned to have 24 Colossi. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, their first thought was something like 68 or something like that. And they 48. <laughs> they 48. Like, yeah, there? okay, 48. Oh, they they immediately were like, okay, that's not that's not happening. Yeah, thank well, God I heard that. that that was the number they, they originally pitched the idea with. It wasn't necessarily... <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. They, they, they did go ahead with development on 24 of them, so there are a handful of unused concepts. At that point, I'm glad it's only just a Colossa you have to fight and nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 16 actually ends up being a pretty good a pretty good amount by the end. I mean, in terms of that, I even felt about maybe about 10 in, if not slightly earlier, that I was waiting for something to change. And, you know, whether it's uh, through narrative or uh, gameplay. But, you know, even in the gameplay, typically a game will have some change some twist some new addition some evolution. change yeah uh, some amount of evolution some at some point around the halfway mark or a bit later to keep you engaged because otherwise as it is in this game you're doing the same thing you were doing in the first colossus by the 16th and you know i just found myself like oh i'm just doing this again but with a different looking guy or a more frustrating guy so in terms of that, I, I wish there would have been something aside from the Colossus or uh, designing Colossus in a way with new uh, mechanics. Yeah, new mechanics or new design uh, philosophy in mind. I think you can sort of pull them apart into different sets, right? You kind of have the humanoid ones, you kind of have the flying ones, and even the flying ones are similar to say the the catfish one where you kind of run along its back same with like the the sandworm one so there are slightly different ones but i'd argue the biggest difference is whether they're uh, aggressive or not whether they aggro without you or mm -hmm. whether they're passive yeah, i mean in terms of the um actual mechanics of uh traveling through the world i i know you guys have mentioned issues with camera you know trying oh, to uh, yep. fight the camera while you're <laughs> yeah. The 17th things. Colossus. The 17th. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I actually found that, you know, it's almost counterintuitive at this point with how we learned to play games, uh, you know, in, in this day, 2020. <laughs> but while I was playing, after trying to fight the controls for the first, you know, 20, 30 minutes of the game, I realized that just letting go of half of it is the best way to deal with it because you know the for better or worse the controls for aggro for your horse 
are different. They're a different take on the horseback controls in a video game where kind of like tank controls, but for a horse. Yeah, it's you know, you're <laughs> controlling the reins. You're not taking control of the horse as it is in most games. Um, so by that means you have to pull left for your horse to turn left or pull right for your horse to turn right, but there's no hold forward to go or uh, you know, instant stop. You have to pull back on the reins to slow it down and he'll eventually stop. And yeah, about that, I want to say really quick. The fastest way to get the horse to stop is to jump off the horse. It yeah. will stop <laughs> faster if you fly off the horse than if you yeah. tell it to fucking stop. <laughs> yeah, I think most people end up doing that probably by the end because it is not convenient. Well, just to go back and talk about the camera for a second, um, as you say, if you leave it, uh, you will, yeah, you'll mostly be fine. But there are certain instances where when you're actually fighting the Colossi, like if you're climbing on one where the angle won't, you know, you'll want to see, you'll want to look a little ahead or you'll want to look at something that it's doing. Um, and you can't really see just by the angle that it's showing you. Um, but if you try to, like, it'll let you move the camera to a different angle, but then it will immediately pull itself back, which is just, uh, <laughs> I think <laughs> maybe there should have been at least like a little buffer time in there. Like, okay, we'll <laughs> let you like pull the camera away for a few seconds and then we'll pull back or something like that. Cause, of course, I mean, uh, it is a little frustrating there. Yeah, yeah I was, yeah. was going to say was that, um, Treating the game like a game that existed before dual analog was the best way I found to control it. Where if you're only using the left stick move and letting aggro do his own thing to travel, then I found it was the most smooth. Yeah, well, aggro will do his own thing regardless. And that's one thing that I really dislike about some of the controls is that aggro will, like when you're riding through the forest, will try to pick a path for you mm -hmm. and jerk away from what direction you're controlling him. And then if you do mess up and then you get off path, he just refuses to walk. You know, when oh, the horse they, controls when go they, wrong, they really do go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when they were designing it, they were planning on having it be that the horse would just ignore 50% of your, your inputs. What do you mean they planned? Didn't they go through with it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think they cut it down by like a significant amount, but I don't know what it is exactly. It definitely does ignore some of your commands. I don't know to what extent. I know they tried to make it like as like realistic like a real horse, but yeah. I think it kind of hurt the game in that detriment. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, there's hard. parts where you just get bogged down. I know uh, even just on this playthrough, when I was going through one of the heavily wooded areas, I happened yep. to get off the path, and then I was basically just stuck in between all these trees, and it just wouldn't, the horse just wouldn't move. It wouldn't go anywhere. And, you know, that's something I think they really need to they need to account for like at least have the horse path itself out of there somehow it seems like the problem is them trying to decide between uh convenient gameplay or the artistic intention of them trying to make you feel like you're actually controlling a real horse where mm -hmm. it's a yeah. you know conscious thing itself and it won't run into a wall if you try and tell it and it controls itself you just try and steer it right but you know when it leads to heavy frustration that's not i think that's an issue that's kind of a good segue into just the controls in general in this game i don't know maybe you could say that they tried to add like weight or like whatever you want to say they tried to do with the controls it doesn't feel good to play at all like the horse may try to do horse things and you're supposed to control like it's a real horse but it takes away from the gameplay in a similar way the controls like when you jump like maybe they wanted it to feel like, oh, like you really like almost crouch down and jump forward and you're almost committed to it. But it ends up just feeling really floaty and awkward to, to use in a 3D space. Yeah, clearly the game was designed with hooves in mind, not finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, we talked uh, on the Uncharted episode about how frustrating it can be to fight with the controls to get your desired outputs. And I mean, that sort of thing, that struggle takes center stage in this game. That's what this game is. Yeah. Like the Colossi barely even fight back. You're mainly just fighting the controls. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, again, you can argue that this was their <laughs> deliberate intention, which I think it was um, for it for you to feel, I guess, kind of less formidable or, or more insignificant. Um, but then, of course, that comes with the trade off of, you know, most players getting frustrated with it, which 
I can't imagine that was their intent there. Especially when you get knocked on your ass over and over again <laughs> when you're fighting, like, I think it was the bull or lion colossi. Yeah, talk about the 10th colossus. So, <laughs> the 11. So 11, yeah, 11, 11. You're right, 11, sorry. Yeah. That, I think that was the most frustrating one. Yeah, I yeah. think I got stun locked in there for about 30 seconds at least, where I was just knocked against a wall and could not get Wander up before Celosia ended up hitting me again and it just kept happening over and over and over and whether that's a blatant oversight by them or if it was somehow intentional which would blow can't my imagine. mind yeah. <laughs> can't I mean, imagine that was intentional it, it does feel, feel intentional terrible. to a point because there are some attacks that you can get up from quickly and some that you can't and whether or not it feels like it's a heavy blow that the colossus is dealing is inconsequential to the amount of stun you face afterwards and the thing is too is even the stun like Throughout the game, I died three times throughout my entire playthrough, none of which were due to Colossus. The only <laughs> three times I died were due to janky geometry and either slipping off a ledge near the lake in the northeast or because I tried to jump on something for the final Colossus, the little bridge at the beginning, which oh, looks God. like it should be able to be jumped to and you just don't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but okay. so it's you know these moments where you're getting knocked down and it's supposed to feel big and you're laying there unconscious or just you know unresponsive for a sec it does no damage there, there was almost no point where i was like actually concerned about dying <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm realistically real you should die in one shot to anything these guys are doing to you <laughs> true for the sake of this not being the most frustrating video game of all time and uh, i mean granted i played on normal but you know, yeah. it's this is the difficulty that they and you know, this is the difficulty that most people would play on the first time. And if it feels like it's not a challenge in the actual fights due to threat of death, then the challenge simply becomes frustration due to uh, not being able to grapple with the controls or being locked in the crowd control or anything along those lines. It would feel slightly better if you know, Wanda was like slowly and like tirefully getting up like you could see that he was in pain but he just like takes a nap <laughs> he just like doesn't even start to get up it yeah. takes a sec i was kind of personally expecting like if you can like bash on circle or something like some button prompt to like get him up faster yeah so you can do that with some attacks i think and that's what i was talking about some attacks it feels like you jump right back up and then some you don't well it seemed like you could kind of button mash when you got when you got uh like knocked down in such a way that you could you know, not in an in intended interaction, but you could kind of roll out of it, sort of, after mm -hmm. taking the damage, but that's not what they're expecting you to do, I don't think. Um, and I mean, we talked uh, again on, on Uncharted about how if you have a game, a single-player game, where you really want the story and the presentation to take center stage, that you don't want the player to like get bogged down by certain uh like instances like in uncharted like the big uh, big domed room with the gatling gun um, you know <laughs> you don't want the the player to kind of lose that momentum and i think in this game that's definitely what they were trying to do by making it so you, you really don't die that much true yeah. and i guess the the da the downside there is that the class i start to feel less formidable which yeah I they're less of a threat time. yeah well most of them don't like don't even have attacks really like aside from like maybe like the gecko and I mean, I guess the sandworm and a couple others, like most of them just kind of try to shake you off and then just sort of go about their day. Yeah, I don't know if you can even be killed by number two, the mammoth. <laughs> if you try to stand <laughs> under it, maybe. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, again, of course, I think that's definitely intentional. And we'll definitely get into that in the uh, story. And I think it also actually, that sort of ties into what the combat system actually is in the game. Like, most of the colossi don't have combat abilities or you know, attacks to dodge necessarily. Some of them do, obviously, but you know, as you're saying, it doesn't feel like many do. And I think it's because there's not actually a traditional combat mechanic in this game. Like, basically, the combat is a puzzle. All you're yeah, doing you is trying you to don't get... properly fight. Yeah, you're just trying to get wander to a weak spot, <laughs> and then you just hit square you know, stab it until it's dead or until a new weak spot uh, appears. 
So there's no actual combat in the game, if I can say that, I think. Like, it I, definitely thinks, like, the the sword and the bow are just tools for you yeah, to use. Yeah, I mean, it, it treats combat as a puzzle mechanic, as opposed to an action-oriented, dynamic mechanic. Right. Which, I mean, makes sense. There isn't, in, in the universe, there isn't much you could really do to fight the Colossus, really. No, um, that's true. I think they do a good job of representing the only way you could realistically kill something of that size. And half what, of that if they weren't trying to you. kill you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It kind of goes forward to a point where even on the 15th Colossus, the like third Minotaur looking one, where you try to, you have to get it to stomp on these plates to kind of push up so you can climb along the, the edges of this valley and eventually climb onto it itself. Trying to get it to stamp on the thing was nearly impossible. And you could be sitting on the target, hitting him with arrows, and he will take like somewhere between like 30 seconds and a minute just to line himself up just to do the one attack. And it's really, yeah. And yeah, something yeah. like that just kind of feel like it, it really subtracts from the game when you're waiting for the Colossus to do what they're supposed to do. And then the best part is that he wanders away. Yeah. <laughs> for me, unless he's on the other end of the arena on that one, and you're just waiting for him to make his way over while you're, like, raining arrows down on him. Um, <laughs> I actually found that it was fairly reliable once I realized that was what you're supposed to do, to just sit on the stone, wait for him to line up, and as soon as his animation for lifting his leg started, I would just get out of the way, he'd hit it, and I'd be up and gone. The, the yeah, issue I found he, with that... Because, like, his fucking shuffle... <laughs> <laughs> like we're trying to fucking party rock before we actually stamp on the thing yeah I mean the issue I found with that fight in particular was uh, clarity of and, and I found this was actually an issue in many encounters was clarity of what you're supposed to do in the environment yeah. or in the Colossus where in this fight in particular you had to do that have them stamp on the thing it would push, your, push it up you jump and then from there you know you look around and there's some stairways on different ends and but there's no clear way to get to them you know you could try jumping and grabbing but you just slide off and you got to repeat the first step over and over until you figure out if you can figure out that you're supposed to stand next to some collapsed rubble which it doesn't look like you know it looks like set dressing it's just there for a aesthetic building yeah it's building out the arena but what you have to do is stand there until he swings his cleaver and hits the wall, and then some more rubble will fall down, and then you can pop up there. But there's nothing, nothing that indicates that, aside from the fact that there's a couple rocks on the platform. I will agree that it, it won't tell you exactly what to do, but I do feel like it didn't take me long to say, okay, so I don't think there's anything up here. There's nothing for me to climb on. Like, what are the, what are the few things that I have left to interact with? And one of them being, okay, let me shoot this guy. Well, the thing for me was, you know, I got to that part where, okay, there's nothing up here, but there's three other sort of quarters of this arena with the same platform, stairs, everything. So I'm like, okay, so maybe it's not this one. So I tried the next <laughs> one. Maybe it's not this one. Try this. this fight, I stopped overnight. Like, I was playing it for like 20 minutes, stopped, went to sleep, woke up, kept playing, and then I was finally able to beat him once I realized <laughs> this. Because it's like, you know the obvious thing is it's not this one there's three more i'll try one of those mm. and like you're saying it takes forever to even get that first interaction for him to knock the platform up i guess my assumption was like you guys aren't that ass a game design right like i don't know it's, it's not the other ones right <laughs> well clearly my standards were lower well, definitely the stairs were a misdirection for me because i was like oh that's definitely where i gotta go because yeah. you go up the stairs and you go up like go up in elevation that's how stairs <laughs> um <laughs> but yeah i mean it's definitely frustrating how much patience is required to beat some of the colossi like number five the first flying one like if you fall off it's going to take you probably another like solid minute just to swim to another uh you know another pillar shoot mm -hmm. him at get his attention get him to come back any colossus with water awful yeah. yeah, and you lose all that momentum. Which it took me a while for that one because I remember I was on a party chat with Cameron and Evan. I was like, so how do I actually get this bird to come get me? 
Yeah, that's I, the other like, thing. There's nothing. Sorry, Mark, but the, no, sorry. <laughs> finish there. But just just to add to that, there's nothing that tells you, oh, using your bow to shoot these guys will garner a reaction unless you just use your bow to shoot these guys. Well, I waited long uh, enough. I feel like that's pretty evident. I don't know, man. I mean, it's just only because it's one of your two tools available. But so it's more it, evident. <laughs> well, but it's clear that it doesn't do anything most of the time, anyways. Well, I learned two things from that fight. Like after a while, Dorman will like actually tell you, like it will give you a very vague, but, like hint of how to actually, you know, get its attention. So it's like, yeah, you probably use your bow. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. And then for the longest time, I thought there's like arrow drop like I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was like oh if i i have to like compensate for the arrow and then make it shoot i'm like no it literally just goes in the street yeah then you leaned in you're like where is that arrow going That's like, what <laughs> yeah well there is a little bit of feedback uh with what the uh, boat can do is that when you shoot a colossus most of the time its eyes will turn orange uh, yeah if they're like to indicate that they've been aggroed and just a nice speaking touch, of unclear Colossus mechanics and Ooh. eyes. I would like to talk about the little fucking sandworm. <laughs> yeah. Now I don't remember that was uh the tenth dirge. That's ten dirge. Yeah, that's 10, yeah. So up ten colossus so far, nine colossus so far, and none of them have eyes as weak spots or hit boxes even. Yeah, I remember one, yeah. in my first uh first or second, either against uh the mammoth or the uh, first colossus i tried to hit the eyes because you know big glowing thing you know, might be a weak spot and it very clearly made me realize no these things aren't interactable so while i was fighting the 10th i'm trying to figure out what the hell to do and i i got to the point where i actually had to google like <laughs> like what am i doing here and it says oh you got to shoot them in the eye so it's like it's the game has spent more than half of its runtime so far telling the player that eyes are not interactable elements the game totally betrayed your instinct. and now it's like oh by the way these ones are integral to beating it and they don't look any different they don't act any different the only difference is it's in your face and well, I, guess I will say they are pretty huge just, the eyes well, yeah but I think the game just hopes that you start firing arrows as there's nothing left to do and one of them happens to hit the eyes because you can fire an arrow and it not hit the eye it can hit the face and nothing happens mm -hmm. yeah i'll definitely i'll definitely give you that when i played this the first time um i i didn't actually own it i had to go to a friend's house to play it and we were playing through it having a good time and we got to number 10 and we just couldn't figure it out like at all and i literally never even came back and finished it because of this one but <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i mean later, the, even uh, like, google came to the rescue even the uh arena that you're fighting in is misleading because there's all these rock towers which are clearly meant for a uh, refuge if you end up in the sand but you shouldn't use them at all you should just stay on aggro and ride around so the fact that these stone structures are there it makes you think okay maybe i need to stand on it bait it in and maybe it will bust its head up on one of them and then it will be vulnerable but it's not the case i mean those things are useless aside from just uh orienting yourself in the arena while you're riding my first reaction to it was okay he can crash through some of the smaller rock things and you can see them break maybe i have to try to lead him into one of the bigger ones right and then that yeah, just turned uh... into fighting with aggro and fighting with the camera to, <laughs> oh my god it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I remember, I, mean, I remember being chased by it and then realizing that how the camera pans back. It's like, okay, I think this, the game is trying to tell me that I should probably pull out my bow at this point. Mm -hmm. And that's why I forgot, oh, that's how you do it. Okay. They they definitely try to like put you in that direction, but I know that Dorman's hint on that one specifically, he just says you can't outrun this thing without your Horus, which is like, yeah, yeah okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, <laughs> game. Obviously. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I think the uh the one word that came to my mind constantly throughout playing this game is obtuse. This game is obtuse. It is <laughs> unclear. It's heavy handed sometimes or just not there at all. It just is not clear what you're supposed to do a lot of the time. And even the uh, hints that Dorman ends up giving you sometimes, you know, they can be really vague or they can come way too early. Yeah. Like maybe you're yeah, stuck absolutely. swimming in the water trying to get half a kilometer over with your <laughs> half a kilometer an hour move speed. Oh. And I didn't realize you could actually 
you can dive yeah, underwater and all. Tools, swim faster. I was like, oh, no one told me this. That's also something I don't tell you about. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it seems like a very, I guess, like uh, old game design now, like where you'd have these adventure games that have, as you say, very obtuse solutions to their puzzles that, you know, you look up on the internet and you go like, oh, how was I supposed to, you know, how was I supposed to figure that out kind of thing, yeah. which is not, you know, I, don't know. I would argue never that... want the player to go on Google and I mean, if you can't figure it out in 20 to 30 minutes, like that's probably too much. I would argue that some of them, I think you have to be in the right mind space for some of them. Cause I think a lot of the time, like, look, if you're, when you're fighting the first Colossus, your first thought is not, okay, I'm going to nibble at this guy's toes until he falls <laughs> over and dies. Right. <laughs> like right from the, from right from the beginning, even before you get to the first Colossus, I want to say they teach you pretty easily. Okay. This game is about verticality. Right. And then you get to the, that Colossus and you can see, okay, so clearly I'm supposed to climb this guy. There's clearly like a balcony, a back veranda on his belt, right? That you can chill out on. And then, okay, so I need to go up, right? And then you get to the second one and the second one teaches you that, okay, so I can't immediately climb from him. What's he doing? He's walking around. Okay. And then you look at his feet and there's glowy objects on his feet, right? That you can shoot. And I feel like a lot of the Colossus sort of evolve from this point of teaching you simple lessons except for the third one him having to hit the like dome in the middle that, that's <laughs> that took like, me a while that's a that's a one-off that's a one-off okay <laughs> but a lot of the time i feel like you can look around and say okay what's new about this arena what tools do i have how can i interact with them right like for the uh the fifth one the bird right you're not gonna like just stand there you're just gonna fly around right you're gonna think okay how can i get his attention i'm gonna shoot him with arrows okay great now he's coming after me so you understand that some bosses can be aggroed with arrows, right? In a similar way, the the worm or like the catfish uh, ones, you understand that, okay, there are uh, little landmarks on their back. So that's probably where the weak spots are. Or not even that that's where the weak spots are. It's these are objects or areas of interest, right? These are unique yeah, points. Of, yeah, and they're not always so intention grabbing. Like on the 12th one, how he's kind of got the teeth on, around his crown. That one's a little less attention grabbing. But That's the sea monster one, yeah, I'd, the sea I'd argue one. that those ones are actually more obvious because they're so different from every other. They other they color. are in this one. In the original one, they they're not nearly oh, as really? colored <laughs> differently. Yeah, they're definitely not. But uh, a lot of the time, they have unique features. I think that's the point that I'm trying to say is that generally they usually have some sort of unique feature that if you kind of go through a quick little flow chart, you can <laughs> generally figure them out. I mean, but you were saying there, you know, correctly that the game's trying to teach you lessons and you're supposed to carry those lessons forward. So you mentioned the verticality and like very clearly a lot of the game and a lot of the encounters are very vertical where you're trying to climb up a Colossus or climb up to a vantage point or climb up something. And, you know, we were mentioning the bird here and that's a point where I was there trying, you know, the game's taught me to this point that you want to climb up vertical structures. And this bird's mm -hmm. flying through the air, and there's a lot of vertical structures around. You know, a lot of them get fairly high up. So my first thought is, okay, well, clearly I need to get to one of these, figure out how to climb it, get high enough to then interact with the bird. Right. Which, you know, this is a lesson the game has taught you already that you want to climb objects to get to a position where you have an advantage or just an opportunity, which was incorrect. And I mean, it, it's the same issue as with uh, the 15th one where, okay, you can't, you know, you can't climb one, but there's four others. So what if you can climb one of those? So then you end up spending absurd amounts of time trying to swim to get to another one. And I think after the second or third, I'm like, okay, this is clearly not the thing. They're all the same. What now? But the problem is the game teaches you a lesson and then contradicts it. Well, then I, I'd go back. Okay, so I agree that like the verticality on the fifth one, like if the game shouldn't have to teach that, hey, by the way, swimming in this game totally sucks. <laughs> <laughs> go go around swimming, try to climb up other things. I, I'll, I'll give that because that's definitely the way that I tried to do it the first time too. On the fifth one, I'll argue if you go back to the flow chart, What's different about this guy? What grabs your eye? He's got a weapon. He's one of three colossi in the entire game that has a weapon. And he's one of two that actually make you use it because the first one just kind of has it. But the other two actually do use it, and that's how you're supposed to beat them. So, I mean, it's not, it's not directly in your face, 
but again, you really do have to go back to that mindset of, okay, what is different? I think that's definitely what they're going for. But part of me has to wonder if it also wasn't intentional by some degree to, um, you know, have the player spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure things out, much like a lot of classic uh, games, well, from before that time were like, you know, uh, like a lot of classic NES games where they had very obtuse solutions um, just to get people to, you know, rent the game over and over. Um, hmm. But then, you know, now we kind of have the opposite of this style of gameplay where a lot of games these days seem maybe too obvious and too handholdy. So there's definitely a balance that has to be striked. And this one perhaps went too far. I think the, the, other the thing is, is that if they're trying to be clever, you know, which is fair and, and definitely uh, something that I want a lot of developers to be when it comes to designing uh, encounters like this or any other where i think the trick is is it has to follow the logic that the game is applied already and when it contradicts the logic as if you know in in any medium where logic is proposed and then contradicted it's the worst possible way to do <laughs> it because yeah. if you tell a player this is how something works and then that doesn't work later you know even if it's once or from then on then you you're just sort of lie you're teaching them something that is going to make things harder in the future simply because they assume they they trust you as the uh you know the the thing they're playing or the developer to tell them the correct way to do something whether it's uh, clear and simple or complex and a bit more creative well, then... an issue that stems to mind right away from that is this game uses purely gameplay to teach you these lessons, right? So whether or not you're learning what they intend to teach you is, is sort of up to you, sort of up to the interpretation. And I would bring up the uh, 15th guy again there with the uh, trying to get the rubble to fall so you can uh, get more elevated. You know, it's, it's a fine mechanic. It's, it's a creative solution. You know, ignore the stairs. That's not going to work. The trick is there's nothing to tell you that this will work aside from happening to be there or running out of any other option. I mean, if there was a cleaved looking section of rock above where the rocks had fallen or something else to indicate that more rocks can fall, then it's safe to assume that the player is given the information needed to come to a conclusion, even if it's obvious or not. But the way it is, is there's nothing to indicate it that anything more can happen except for getting desperate or just taking a, a gamble on something. Which is fair. One thing that stems to mind for me is how the 12th Colossus, how you can't beat him on the starting platform, and they just make you swim past this <laughs> giant Colossus, which I assume is more mobile and water than you, to a different <laughs> structure entirely. And she's like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> that does that definitely feels so is a wrong. lot of trial and error in this and i think that can lead to a lot of frustrations but i think we've gone on, on enough about how frustrating this game can be <laughs> uh, so maybe we'll move on to talk about the story a little bit which um i think is probably the game's strongest feature you could argue or, or one of its strong um selling points um it's definitely uh, you know, it's very ambiguous the way that it's told. Nothing is really stated outright. Um, I mean, you have characters whose motivations you don't really know the why of. I mean, on surface, it's pretty simple. Uh, clearly, Mono is important to Wander somehow, but we're not told how. We don't know if she's his wife or his sister or just a friend or really what the case is. We don't know why she was sacrificed other than she in air quotes, had a cursed fate, whatever that means. Um, but it, it adds a lot of mystique to it, I think, which is a big part of what gets so many people interested in it. And I mean, even even Dorman and Lord Amon, we don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, clearly Dorman wants to be free, but we don't know why he's there in the first place. We don't know if he's even evil necessarily, which is interesting. It's very ambiguous in that way. Like, I know I... Um... When I first booted up the game and like watching the intro cutscene, despite being long, I was like, 
Okay, so do I just go kill these Kalata and then just date the girl? Like, is that? And then, like, throughout the entire game, like, I was like, okay, you know, knocking down these Kalata. And then I think it wasn't until, I think, number eight, you get, like, a bit more story to the game where, like, Lord Ermin and his trope of guards or whatever, like, are coming into the valley. You're like, oh, well, now, now things are getting interesting. And then you don't see them again until, like, after the 16th. You know, I actually think that, you know, what you were mentioning, Perry, that it was very interesting, the uh, introduction to the characters and their motivations and all that. And Mark, you were saying that, you know, it's interesting with the uh, introduction of these other characters and the fact that they're trying to stop you. The beginning and the end of this game are the only compelling narrative aspects nothing happens in between that's like, true there, there's a point later in the game where Dorman says people are coming to get in your way yeah please hurry it's yeah like, please oh, hurry and then you know i'm thinking oh you know are they gonna actually try and stop me am i gonna have to avoid them anything but nothing happens until you defeat the 12 colossus and then they show up and it's all cutscene. so the story of the game takes place in the first opening the intro cutscene. And the ending cutscene. In yeah, between, but is, this just is, this, is this inherently a bad thing? I think that I was waiting for stuff to happen throughout it. I mean, the the first half is fine. Like you know, if you have you have a goal, you're trying to kill the Colossus, and that's fine. But nothing changes, and it's the same idea that I was mentioning with the gameplay, where I'm waiting for something to happen and to make stuff compelling, or just something to evolve. And in this case, in terms of the story, nothing does evolve until the very end. And I think I realized that probably a lot of the reason why people consider Shadow of the Colossus such a masterpiece is the ending sequence is incredible. I mean, obviously it, it subverts expectations if you're not aware of it. Um, and it, it's sad, it's not happy, and it leaves you with a different opinion than most games would leave you with in the end but because it's the last experience you have with it in terms of a playthrough that's what you're going to remember most almost so i think that it tweaks how many people remember the game because the ending was so strong but i find that i would almost forget that nothing happens in between i remember like i think um, early on after being around the colossa you get like this bit of a i guess like vision where you see uh, the girl like awake and just like looking at yeah, you. And nothing happens after that. And then it's like, oh, okay. It's like, oh, what, what's happening? And then nothing. And then later on, on my way to the 16th Colossi, after being told by Dorman that, oh, there's people after you, better hurry. I was kind of expecting it to be like people after me as I'm getting to the 16th Colossus. That definitely could have been interesting. But I think it's really going to come down to whether the the gameplay and i guess the spectacle of the colossi was enough to carry the interest for you or not and i mean definitely in my case uh it i was absolutely just enthralled just to see each new one but i can see how uh yeah i mean I, well the thing is i can't see how they could really change the story to drip feed it to you as it goes along but well at least giving one more point you know, either two thirds or halfway through that sort of reinvigorate your curiosity with the narrative. Because, you know, as we've been saying, the gameplay is kind of weak, you know, relative, whether or not we like the Colossus themselves. But if the gameplay is kind of weak and a bit shallow, and the narrative is kind of weak and a bit shallow until the end and the beginning, then what's left to carry it aside from what you said, just being curious what the next Colossus is? Well, I'll say this. This is the only time I'm going to say this, but back in the day when it came out, the <laughs> gameplay didn't like it was amazing. And just the scale of everything was so amazing that it did make up for the shortcomings in the and perhaps the quality of the controls. But I think you're right. I think it would have been easy to even if there was slightly more dialogue with Dorman and even if he were to like have a little bit of a conversation with you and like sort of like slip up or like mention that, OK, maybe you're starting to question this guy's motives. Because, I mean, That's my true. first thought right off the bat was, I don't know, this guy's like, 
the guardian of the temple or something or whatever. And he's like actually trying to help me do this or whatever. Right. Which I mean, I guess adds to the twist, but I feel like they could have done more with the character. Yeah. I definitely would have liked to hear more from Dorman and, and there's no really reason why they couldn't have other than they just didn't want to give you more info than, than was necessary. I definitely think they could have like maybe expanded a bit on the like world building. Cause like, I think when I first started playing, when I first saw a shrine, I was like, oh, I'll go there and check it out, you know, pray to the shrine thing. And then only to realize, oh, this is just a save point. Like, I thought to be like, you know, some sort of like background context to like knowing more about the forbidden land besides of what you're told at the very start. So I will say, Perry kind of mentioned a little bit of this earlier about kind of like the hauntingly emptiness of uh, the Forbidden Valley. It kind of leads to a. I don't know if I were to compare it sort of what they try to go for and follow three, a game that is supposed to feel empty. There is kind of like a hauntingness and sort of a, it almost makes you use your own creativity. Yeah. It makes you be creative and sort of give your own story to the land because it's not like there aren't, there isn't variation within the land. Like there's lots of different sceneries and areas and, and there's like temples, which I mean, is just a box of toys for your imagination, right. To play with. So I, I kind of like the idea of how haunting it is and how little they give you to go with it to an extent. I'm with you, Mark, where the part where, okay, maybe at the end, I, by the end of the game, I would have liked to have a little bit more closure about this area. But I thought for the most part, it kind of just stringing along and you like having all these questions bouncing around your head kind of worked to have a good effect in some ways. Well, yeah, I think definitely the interpretation like how much of it is left up to the player. I definitely appreciate Like, I don't think necessarily if they told us more of the facts, if that would make the story better. I think just by having all these like kind of this empty world with these little pockets of of things to look at, which really don't amount to that much in the end. But um, as you say, you can kind of imagine that this place was probably... Uh, some sort of civilization there's definitely uh, remnants of structures all over the place and uh, you know you can put it you can kind of make up your own story which i like if they had conclusively come out and just said like (laughs) dormans and evil spirit (laughs) like he must be (laughs) cast away and must throw the ring into the fires of (laughs) mount doom and all this stuff you know Uh, i do like that they don't do i don't i do like that they don't do exposition dumps and then just all of a sudden dump all this heavy handed lore on you. Yeah. I feel like there's definitely some games that absolutely ruin its story pacing by just all of a sudden, okay, now we're going to take, you know, like a good 10, 15 minute break from the game just to, to tell you what the hell's going on here. And I'm I'm happy they didn't do that. World building like this, where it's entirely just up to you to almost sort of decide up until a point, I guess the end, they kind of spell out a bit about Dorman and the uh, other people that come in. But in terms of the actual world itself, it's not a bad thing that it doesn't tell you anything. I think it's like you guys are saying that being able to almost think of it yourself or, you know, imagine that what this world used to be, if this world used to be anything, is uh, effective because you don't need to know uh, to appreciate the rest of the story. I remember at one point, well, I think I was on my way to one of the forest colossi. I stumbled upon like a little cave because I thought that was the way you had to go. And it turns out it was just a dead end. And that, but there was like this random barrel with like hmm. a blue light. I was like, oh, <laughs> that that's was, pretty cool. That was added in. Yeah. And I was like, oh, and then I get a trophy. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's just a random barrel. And it's like, I wonder what purpose this barrel was or anything. <laughs> Well, so specifically, it's, it's a Easter egg to the Last Guardian, which was oh, okay. in the original <laughs> shot of the classes. So, I guess but I wouldn't. There you go. You can <laughs> ascribe all the personality to a barrel you want. And that's just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The shot of the classes, you know, affords you. I mean, out of all the characters we know, it probably has the second most personality in the. <laughs> game, so. It has about as much personality as Mono, who just uh, <laughs> yeah. sits, you know, sits still, much like the barrel. Yes, and which we both know still have more personality than Wanda, so... Yeah, I'm pretty sure Aggro is the most fleshed-out character in this game. Yeah. Made okay. me feel emotions, actually, when he flew off. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, if, if it wasn't a horse, if that was a person, I'd go, oh, thank God. 
<laughs> Get out of here, dude. I hate that horse. Much <laughs> like, I couldn't see like animal cruelty and stuff like that, but like honestly, holy crap, part of me was happy when he flew off that cliff. Well, it's funny that segment where it's like, you know, obviously it's there to lose aggro for you uh, for the rest of the game, but and then trigger some kind of emotional response. But because I just flew myself off the other end of that bridge <laughs> twice over trying to uh, figure Check out what the fuck I'm doing, yeah, and I didn't the having to run thing. all the way back twice <laughs> by the point that I'm like, oh, they're just trying to kill my horse. Okay, <laughs> so it's like they, they, you know, that could have been more effective. Or yeah. a bit more, you need the horse to get here, and it's not just a jump you can't make because of reasons. Well, they could have just scripted that whole segment, I think. I don't think it necessarily had to be a jump on the player's part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I was getting to stairs, and I'm thinking, okay, like there's a, there is a shrine really close, so you wouldn't have had to have walked all the way back. Like I mean, Really had... close is still kind of relative to the rest of this game. It's like, a, <laughs> it's like barely a minute to get back up there. Yeah, but barely but... a minute of trying to control aggro can get... <laughs> but the point my point is like most time when you see stairs you just you know assume okay now i'm going to the temple bit i'm not going to need aggro for this bit right and I just, you walk up them and that's the exact same thing that i did killed myself twice trying to jump across the exactly. thing that's just <laughs> barely out of reach yeah because the game yeah, has yeah. spent some time ex- teaching you that you know stairs are a pain in the butt to ride up with aggro and tight spaces are a pain tight corners so you know, it's, it's a small area. I'll just hop off. I'll do this myself. We don't need aggro. And, you know, another little obtuse section of design, I think. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, I definitely, I uh, died on that one once myself. So I have to imagine <laughs> how many players are, are hitting that on the first try with the horse. Yeah. But, I mean, that's definitely something they could have looked at with the remaster. But <laughs> yeah, I, I also wanted to bring up, though, um, that... I feel like there's untapped potential in terms of world sort of environmental. Uh, I'm not even sure I'd call it storytelling, but you know, with the second, with the mammoth Colossus, the second one, you often see it, you know, it's, it's remains as you pass over that Northwest uh, sort of bridge. And it, it's really effective for what it does. It's constantly showing you like you look at like, this is what you've done. You've killed this thing and it's just laying there. And the way that they've laid out, you know, how you're getting to the Colossus, where the Colossus or Colossi are, you're not often retreading a location where you've killed one. And I feel like it's such an effective use of the second Colossus by having it there in plain view a lot of the time that it's missed opportunity by if they were able to rearrange the path that you would need to get through the world or the way the world is structured so that you do have to pass uh, certain arenas where you've, you know, fought a Colossus before and its body is there. And, you know, if you ever go back to the Northwest Lake where you fight the uh, tooth one, I can't can't remember. That's the uh, 12th (laughs) one. Yeah. Yeah. 12th guy. If you go back there, you see that his body's in the middle of the lake and there's moss and plants growing off it. And it's a, like it's beautiful and it's sad. But you will never see it unless you just accidentally go there because you're trying to get to the 15th Colossus. Yeah, or if you so, care to actually go there again. So I yeah, agree. Which I do is, like that you know. they put that on the map. And I like that you can see it. If you watch through the end credits, you will see the remains of all the of all the other Colossus. But I gotta be careful where we did criticize the game so harshly on not wanting to ride through areas again, right? Or just riding through areas, not being very fun or being like, you know, but that really would add bad moments of the game to it. Being able to see effects that you've had on the world as it's, you have to get farther into the world. It's well, I mean, for some you do. Like in order to get to the the catfish, I think you have to pass by the third's battle arena. I mean, you don't see the the dead Colossus, but like the whole point we're we were saying is. I don't like traveling this world. So just the thought of like <laughs> now it wants to make me go through parts that I've already been to see other things. And I, I know it's cool. It's a really cool world building thing. I just, I don't think it would have been the best choice. Well, I think the suggestion here would be somehow laying out the map in such a way that you would see them just on your natural course rather right. than having to retread that, that, that old ground. But this would definitely be like an entire map overhaul if they wanted Mm -hmm. to do something like this yeah you couldn't think of it as 
having to retread a certain amount of area and then add on an equivalent amount afterwards like you know just having to pass through a section of a map to get to another one why well, I, I don't think you can really understate the importance of of spacing around the colossus arenas and oh of course but but the bridge with the second one is a good example of how they can allow yeah. the spacing and allow you to see the well uh, you're right it's super effective but most of the colossi don't you don't fight them in open areas like that I actually think you do fight them in a lot of well, open spaces. But in open problem. spaces, yes, but they're like you kind of walk through, like yeah, the problem is stuff they're together. usually tucked away. Yeah. yeah. So again, like you mentioned, Evan, that could be something due to loading times, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, they do do something with having, I guess, kind of the sky beams that shoot up into the sky after each one that you've killed, and kind of by the end, you can. You know, the sky is lit up with all these lights from everything you killed, which I mean, is an interesting the, effect, but not a more simple impactful. way of doing that. Yeah. On the topic of world building or missing out on possible world building that you brought up, Evan, all the Colossi have names, but how would you ever know that just playing well, the base game? Well, Apparently. I have uh, some bad <laughs> yeah. news for you. Friend. Uh oh, <laughs> those names are all fan made. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. As cool no. as they are, I don't know who came up with them, but they're they're pretty neat, and I like them. They no. seem fitting. But no, I'm uh, sad. officially, but they're still, only that adds to my point. No, I'm going to take this and run with it. They should have had <laughs> names for the classes. They should have had backstories for them. I want to know their lovers. Where do they live? What do they like to drink? Maybe maybe number two had a crippling gambling debt. Like I don't know. Like <laughs> don't know. tell yeah, me about this. In guy. deep with the sharks. That's oh, why yeah. his knees are bent. He had, he had his <laughs> legs broken. But... Okay, all right. I guess this kind of leads into the the twist with all the colossi being a part of a whole, part of a whole. The, the well, one I being, think that that almost ruined some of the sort of the the romance that I had of these giant innocent creatures, either uh, you know humanoid or animalistic. And, you know, you're this person who's come in, you don't care about their life, you don't care about your, their existence, you only care about yourself. You almost don't even care about uh, Mono. Like, this is all for you. She's dead. She doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, this is just because you want her back. Well, and yeah, so you it's go self-serving in, in nature. Yeah, and Dormini she, she might her, appreciate the deed, though, you know? <laughs> maybe, but, you know. <laughs> Give you Dormini a pat on the back. Says, you're going to have to do some tough stuff to get her back. Are you okay with that? And you're like, yeah, whatever. No biggie. So... You know, you spend the whole game assuming you're going killing these innocent creatures, and then it's like, oh, actually, they were part of this giant evil god creature. And oh, well, yeah, hold on a so. sec. Was he evil necessarily? Well, if he was, he, locked brought, up he brought Mono least. back. Uh, but I mean, you can't even say for sure that Lord Iman and the shamans were necessarily the good guys. That's true, but you grow giant shadow spider legs and horns so i think <laughs> in terms of design it seems implied uh, yeah it's implied through the way that he's designed but i mean actions speak louder than words and your boy brought mono back to life so they, I mean, yeah but they also generally don't steal nice things. guys away in like these towers in the middle of dead civilizations well not necessarily <laughs> i mean that's the thing about the ambiguity you could say that dorman we don't even know why he's there you could say that maybe he was imprisoned wrongly well but dorman steals wander's body he used dorm or uh, wander as a means to do this yeah he did but he also told wander that the price he would pay would be high it's not like Wonder, if he was you know, a decent guy, he would have said, "I'm gonna use your body. Are you cool with that?" Well, look, when you're <laughs> hey, talking to a, when you're talking to a hole in the ceiling with light pouring <laughs> down, and he says the price is gonna be high, we're not exactly talking two hundred bucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's clear that he's he's talking about a, a life for a life or something to that nature. I think that's yeah, a pretty easy I conclusion to draw. The game implies then that the life you're giving up are these 16 creatures for one life, which you're supposed to say is your thing. Is that worth it? You're killing 16 innocent things to get one girl back. Depends if you're asking me when I first played this game or when I played it second <laughs> or like most recently. Because when I was young, I was like, hell yeah, these things are monsters. Let's kill these fools, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I had no qualms about kill. I mean, except for the second one, because it's just so clearly helpless. But like... <sighs> The other well, ones, for me. no, not a second thought. 
Yo, by the end the of the game, oh, yeah, by the end of the game, I'm like, screw it. I hate these guys. I'm frustrated. <laughs> I don't care about them. Well, so maybe and... in that way, you've become like Wander, and <laughs> it's actually brilliant. If the well, frustrating controls were simply to make me uh, in exactly. Wander's shoes. <laughs> You are the I mean, Colossus. the last Colossus is uh, pretty evil looking. I'll put that in. There. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely he's got an evil thing going on. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they also set you up in, in, in a way. Uh, I mean, I mean, the average man versus a giant beast is very much your classic David versus Goliath scenario. Uh, like your underdog dynamic. And I feel like most of us are already primed just from the get-go from that imagery for the smaller character to be the good guy facing off against superior odds. And we're inclined, we're inclined to trust that and also to, I guess, empathize with Wander on some level because I guess, you know, we understand his play. Like, he's trying to bring back this girl back from the dead and he clearly cares about her. Um, so I think on some level, uh, they, you know, they want you to empathize and I think it works in that way. I think they, you're right, but it's whether they want you to empathize uh sort of justifiably like you know are you right to empathize with him like he's becomes this cruel person killing these things and at what point do you stop agreeing with his actions depends how much value you put on the colossi right yeah and i think that's what how you see the, the presentation of the story a bit more uh, compelling absolutely i think yeah this is definitely what makes it interesting is that question of whether your actions are, are worth it, really. Mm-hmm. You don't even get the girl at the end. <laughs> if anything, you've trapped her and she's paying the uh, price for your selfishness. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I'll say I don't. I didn't really love the way it ended, too. I mean, I like the part with Dormon and uh, getting sealed away again and all that. But when Mono comes back to life and there's kind of the horn baby, and I guess that maybe that's a throw into Eco. I've never played it, but that it's. <laughs> far as i assume i think there's a lot of suggestion the uh, creator has actually said that this is a spiritual prequel to eco yeah well i yeah i guess so but i it didn't feel fulfilling honestly to me it just kind of felt like okay so now they're there and they <laughs> go up to like the forbidden garden which you can actually get to by the way which is like really? oh really yeah you can you can you can scale the tower and get up there and that's where like you know how back in the day when there wasn't like game facts was kind of the only media on yeah. the about games <laughs> there was like just like how in super smash bros melee like people thought like oh there's a secret way to unlock sonic or something like that right <laughs> that's where people thought that like oh you could trigger a cutscene up there to get a the real ending or like the 17th colossus would be up there right but it turns out there's nothing <laughs> turns out you were in the 17th colossus a lot yeah well not only that but it's, um even after people discovered that Easter egg, people were certain that there was there was more. <laughs> and uh, I watched a really interesting YouTube video. I can't remember the name of the channel. Um, just about people who spent like a solid ten years like looking for this last secret, and Jeez. there wasn't one. <laughs> it sounds like yeah, that's just the days before data mining, I guess, right? So yeah. I feel like as soon as you go in and you data mine, you could just like, oh, you could look through a list of like models and assets and animations, right? And just try to find anything that you don't yeah, the see. Secret in the secret garden, game. definitely an interesting thing, but you have to beat the game several times, I think, in order to have enough grab uh, stamina in order to I get up there. I think the way it works is that every time you beat the regular normal mode, the regular, or sorry, the first time you beat them, normal mode, time attack normal, hard mode, uh, heart attack normal, <laughs> whatever. I, <laughs> man, you just have a heart <laughs> attack because playing this game is just fucking <laughs> ugh, so frustrating. But anyways, once you do that, every time you do that, your your stamina slightly increases. So by the end that yeah. you've done all of those, you kind of have like the ultimate stamina bar, I, I think. And then that allows you to, along with the glitch, apparently like you have to use like a sideways vertical jump or something like that to kind of <laughs> conserve stamina. So apparently it's oh. very difficult to get up there. So basically, it seems like the developers, you know, added it in for the final cutscene, and they just kept it in model in world so that they didn't have to load in a separate uh, group of assets, I guess. To I mean, I think it's still a... just a fun little Easter egg that they can throw in there. That's yeah. true, but if you need a glitch to actually get up there, it no longer. Well, I don't know if that's intentional. Necessarily... Maybe if, it's not a glitch, but true. it's very difficult to get up there, and you have to use a technique that is not 
like evident through playing the game. It's yeah. also not like you can just farm Shining Lizard and like increase your stamina bar. Which is I that found what out. that does? Apparently, yeah. I looked up like <laughs> after beating it. It's like, oh, that's what they do. Like, yeah, I didn't just even know I was them. supposed to catch those things until I happened to see that online. Or, or no, not, not until I went into kill. the items and it's like, oh, how many of these have you got? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, we haven't talked about it much, but yeah, there's salamander tails that you can grab, uh, get to increase your grab stamina. And there's also fruits that hang from trees you can get to what? increase your health. But I mean, neither of those things are, are really necessary at all to play the game. Yeah. Or beat well, it. apparently with this, uh, with the remake, they added gold coins, which gives you a special sword. Yeah. It's like what? Well, actually, it's funny that those gold coins were added uh, in response in the to yeah in uh, this latest remake in the PS4 remake. Uh, it was added in response to those people that spent ten years looking for the last secret. They're like, all right, fine, we'll put one more in. There you go, <laughs> just for you guys. Here you go. I mean, I'd feel bad at that point. It's like, oh, geez, hey guys, have you noticed there's this whole community like spending their life trying to find <laughs> this thing that doesn't exist? Yeah, for good for sure. uh, Yeah, I mean, definitely. That kind of stuff, eh, I'm not really sure why they added it. Just to maybe like pad it out you a little, or it's just there do. for people that want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I have to take your side because this is like the first game that I didn't play through on hard. So <gasps> oh, I know. <laughs> I, guess. I was actually curious. Like, I wonder if Cameron's playing this on hard right now. I actually no. just assumed. <laughs> yeah, I did too. <laughs> no. Well, the thing about hard mode in this game is that it really just adds tedium. I find. Yeah. Uh, basically, what it does is it adds more like sigil spots on the colossi that are in different locations that you have to get to. Hmm. Uh, in some cases, it does actually change the fight a little bit, like what you actually have to do. I know for the first one, it puts one of the sigils like on his right arm, which is like a spot you don't actually have to go to on normal. Uh, but it it has further. You can climb on there if you want, or yeah, if you need to. If the hmm. controls weren't ass, I probably would have. That's like yeah, my I mean, biggest gripe with this game is I like I like tight controls and when the game doesn't like follow my inputs, hmm. done with you. Yeah, it seems like a good way actually to increase difficulty by just adding more of the uh, core gameplay loop of what you have to do. Well, what you're gonna I... say by making the controls even worse? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, that's the way to make it harder too. I guess could they have? <laughs> but yeah, I think it is a good way to. Like ice. Yeah. I think it is a good way of doing it because they easily could have just done, you know, you take more damage, takes more space, stamina, like, takes longer. Like yeah, just like boring things like that. That's true. But I find if you're going to just play through it once, like just to experience it, it's probably, you know, I think normal is just fine for that. Yeah, I mean, by the time I ever got to the uh, weak point, I was just like, thank God, I hope I can just kill it without falling off before having to do this again. Because <laughs> at that point, you know, there's nothing involved in actually killing it. You're just holding on and stabbing it whenever it stops moving. So it's not like that part itself is actually difficult. No. Yeah, well, just uh, one more point about the story, I guess, and then we can move on. Um, even uh, for as ambiguous as it is, um, it is rather simple i guess i mean if you you know boil it down to its core elements you really just have uh kind of a, a i guess it's a somewhat of a trope now of a, a character that wants to bring back uh, i guess a loved one back to back to life and then they strike up a deal with the devil so to speak uh, and then is you know forced to pay a heavy price for their actions and do things they wouldn't otherwise um and so I think the brilliance of the story for me really comes from how it's told or or also how it's not told and, and only implied to you. But I think the reliance on this kind of recognizable story structure is definitely to the story's benefit. Uh, it's something recognizable and, and human, you know, this this desire to bring someone back from the dead. Uh, and, in, and this, you know, seemingly strange spiritual world of gods and giant beasts and magic i think it's something that we can all kind of relate to yeah every every story needs that human relatability or some form of relatability yeah i mean in the most fantastical stories the best ones are the ones that have a simple core human element to it you know it's not the crazy uh unreal things that make a story compelling it's the uh the core emotional aspects. aspect of them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
one thing I think that works too in terms of how the game subverts a lot of sort of typical storytelling tropes in terms of how it ends and the you know you it's not a happy ending is that around you know you know, time for my uh traditional zelda mention here but you know <laughs> this, this, obligatory obligatory yeah. video <laughs> yeah no i think <laughs> it is relevant though because this game came out around when zelda and that sort of fantasy action adventure game was fairly large in terms of a fan base for that style of game and how successful zelda had been until then um so you know it's realistically you're going around fighting large bosses and it's all fairy tale and happy endings in zelda but in this it takes that same expectation of you're the good guy presented with defeating evil large monsters and you don't have to think about it and in the end you'll get the uh, girl back to life and everything's fine. So when it turns and it, you know it's obviously suggestive of it, of it throughout the game, but when it turns and you become this host or the shell of yourself to host the uh, evil, presumably evil god Dorman, it's like suddenly oh this isn't what was supposed to happen, and it becomes more compelling because of that. And then even you know when it doesn't cut after that. It's not just over now that you're possessed. The people are successful in sealing you now back away and you almost become human again for a second. You're trying to desperately get back to mono and the seal is pulling you back and you desperately try and hold on and it's never successful or other games would be successful theoretically and you just outlast it and you survive and you make it and everything's fine. It just isn't. It's kind of refreshing to not get the girl by the end, you know? Yeah, I think that makes it a bit more uh, interesting. Well, games and, and stories that, I guess, are told from the perspective of the, the bad guy, I guess you could say, are always quite compelling, especially when it's not clear from the get-go that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Apparently, you can actually tell, or like I read this up, that you can actually see wanders uh skin kind of change after i was actually gonna say that one thing i would have wished is that it was more obvious that he was changing after a certain point where to me it just seemed like you show up after that last one and now you're gray yeah i would i agree well then that kind of ruins the spoiler that like oh by the way this you're you're the bad guy now but it would it would, like it wouldn't even necessarily have to be that it would just be showing the toll it's taking on you you know, clearly these evil black Spaghetti things are coming at you every time. <laughs> well, you kill one. That's something, true, yeah. that's something going point. on. Yeah. So, well, yeah, so that was definitely the intention. But you know, I've looked up the, I guess, progression pictures, like showing all the different stages that wanders, like texture, like skin texture go does through. Does he in fact it, change? He does in fact, but it's very subtle, very very subtle. I think it was more noticeable in the original PS2, but in this latest one. Uh, you, you may notice, like on the final like stage, I guess, which is after you kill the twelfth one, that uh, his clothes have become noticeably dirtier and like darker. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did and his skin a, has become like a little paler. darker. Yeah. yeah, I actually didn't notice. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but I, I wish that I was, had. At first, my my thought was like, oh, he's kind of getting like battle worn, like after going up against all these colossi. I was like, okay, that's cool detail. And then, I mean, it could just so, be an issue of. Uh... You know, the, the point of view is often very far away from Wander. You know, his character model is not often large and in the middle of the screen. So Especially when you opt to give up on looking other than where it tells you to look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best opportunity to see it would actually probably be getting stun locked against a wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> sure. I guess I want to use that point about the camera to kind of get into... The presentation on this game and i think the reskin on this game is gorgeous like it like blew me away the first time i saw it because like, i've played the original right and the original like it looked like the graphics weren't really what was there to blow you away it was more like the animations and just the the size and the scale of the monsters where you mentioned how you know you fight bosses in zelda too but there was nothing to the size and scale of the colossi in any of those games or any kind of games that you had seen at that time so i feel like that was really the unique 
the unique and definitely the selling point along with how you said you go play it for the gameplay you kind of play it for the the story ish and you play it for just kind of the spectacle of holy crap look at these things and i think now it helps to play it now by making the game just absolutely gorgeous to look at the one thing i will say is that the game and we've mentioned this about the camera the game actively tries to not (laughs) let you look around this gorgeous environment even when you're standing, you mentioned there's the second Colossus underneath the bridge. I got off the horse to try to look at it. It, <laughs> will, it, just, it won't even let you look at the... like. <laughs> it's just so frustrating to me that I thought the world was so beautiful to see it redone. And, and not only um, just like, like they've retextured like everything in this game. And then for you to not be able to properly explore it or like take it in, it just feels like a miss to me. Didn't they pretty much uh, remake this game from the ground up for the PlayStation 4? I wouldn't be surprised. I can't imagine there's much from the PS2 that they could have salvaged. Yeah, well, I can run through the uh, PS4 remaster improvements here. Um, and most notably, yeah, they uh, apparently rebuilt all of the assets entirely from the ground up. Uh, although it does use the same like code base as the original PlayStation 2 game. Right. <laughs> um, and you can see that uh, if you compare the two that the actual level of detail in the geometry of a lot of the world objects is of a far higher detail in this one where you know it wouldn't have just been a simple matter of retexturing like if you look at just the shrine of worship for example uh, compare hd is a very good example of what happens if you only retexture yeah it does not look good Right. So yeah, they uh, updated the geometry and like the shrine of worship. If you make comparisons between that and the this one and the PlayStation Two version, like geometrically, it's a lot more, a lot uh, higher detail there. It, it looks like it's it fits in with a current generation title. Yeah, absolutely. Way worthwhile. It looks incredible. So they definitely added more triangles. Yeah, there's tons <laughs> of triangles in there. Polygons. <laughs> uh, so they also uh, tweak the controls in certain ways, um, like uh, aiming the bow or the so a sword will no longer. Well, it used to be that when you aimed the bow or sword, it would aim where Wander was facing and not where your camera was facing, mm-hmm. which was really really fucking weird. <laughs> it but made, they it made the fifth Colossus so frustrating to hit. Even yeah. the uh, the the flying worm, I can't remember the fourteenth or whatever. Even that 14th. was very difficult to hit on the hmm. ps2 yeah i've got a couple of updates that will probably come as a surprise to everyone here which is <laughs> that they allegedly updated aggro's pathfinding ai to be better yeah, uh, okay. and they sped up uh underwater swim speed oh, oh <laughs> god <laughs> but I not some regular not swim not being worse <laughs> so wait like going underwater to swim is the fastest way to swim right yeah yeah it is. Okay. i did not know that <laughs> yeah. I, learned, I learned that one like later on i was like oh that i mean it's kind of an issue of perspective where as soon as you go underwater it's hard to get a reference point of how, f- you know, how something fast you're going get yeah. engaged mm-hmm. with how fast you're actually going yeah and then you know they also did quite a handful of little quality of life improvements here and there but i won't list them all so you know it's a better remaster than than probably all the other remasters like. we've done well yeah <laughs> more in depth uh, uncharted you know they definitely they definitely took time to you know give it that that care and attention to detail that it deserved uh, but it is worth noting that the art style that this version of the game has i think is markedly different from the original um the original's art style <laughs> i'm not going to say it looks super great but it <laughs> was unique there was a certain angelic or almost spiritual quality that the visuals held like everything seemed almost bathed in in light and mm-hmm. it was this kind of thousand percent bloom but yeah, yeah the bloom was you know way up and it created an interesting style and well it added to the dullness right yeah it was very desaturated though so it, again i'm not saying it was super pretty but it did have its own style which has been i guess lost a little with this graphical update like this world is beautiful oh absolutely i, I wouldn't i wouldn't say otherwise yeah it's, it's a different atmosphere almost than the original to for better or worse i guess yeah well you lose a little bit of personality but like just just look at it yeah <laughs> it's astounding yeah i think what it gains definitely outweighs what it loses in that case and i know that a lot of people these days 
very much dislike excessive bloom and they find it quite hard on the eyes. And I could see that with the more, you know, high definition uh, images and more saturated colors, sort of excessive bloom being a bit, a uh, bit of a strain on your eyes, but I think it might've worked better back then, but you're right. I mean, if that's the case, you definitely lose this almost uh, otherworldly quality from this strange environment it did make it seem a little bit more familiar right like we've all seen forests and we've seen waterfalls <laughs> right yeah i mean uh, well yeah so we've already mentioned how the animation quality in this game is just top notch and for a game from 2005 this was just blowing everything out of the water at the time um mm -hmm. just like quickly some other games that came out that same year of notes you had uh, the first God of War, Resident Evil 4, Battlefield 2, Kingdom Hearts 2, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2. And I mean, by comparison to a lot of those, just the animations on the Colossi and on Wander, on Agro, it's just, it's incredible. So detailed, highly polished. And all of that was very much the same in the release and, and in the remaster here. But I argue that sometimes it feels like it's not quite up to modern par. Like one of the things that bugged me is is still there's a direction you can push on your analog, your left analog stick to move, where Wander doesn't know where he's supposed to go or what dimension <laughs> or he's or, <laughs> or what like plane of existence he's supposed to be on. He just kind of like like darts like left and right, like he's not like he's high and he's not sure where to look. He's, he's a wave dash. He overload. Yeah. Well, it's just there's certain things like that that. And the jump. I've already talked about how the jump just looks weird. It feels weird. It feels bad. It's to super floaty. It feels super floaty. And it doesn't like back then it was kind of cool because you could kind of see the it wasn't like a quick up and down, like a really jolty kind of thing. It kind of had some a bit of like grace to right. how you kind of Well, it's funny you mentioned that, but in terms of the animation, I think it's the opposite. So in most animation, what you want to do is exaggerate the uh, wind up and peak so that there's a very clear sense of motion, but yeah. in the remake, I mean, I'm not sure as how it was in the original, but if you just press jump, you just, you're instantly going up in the air. There's no well, yeah. crouch. That's what I was going to say is that the way that you actually are in the air is somewhat graceful in the way that they animate that. But you're right. There's not really like a, a charge up to the jump. Yeah. The, the physics are just missing for the, uh, airtime you actually get in terms of the animation mm -hmm. and the physics of you just kind of floating around like you weigh yeah. two pounds and there's a stiff breeze <laughs> but speaking of the jump i didn't realize this until like the very end that you can actually charge your jump while you're climbing mm, and i yeah. didn't clue yeah. in at the the ui indicator where like with your standard bar and then like you have these broken up circle kind of like expanding the hey, indicator oh it's charging up Oh, I never realized that. Yeah. And then, like, speaking of the UI, like, I was looking at older footage or gameplay from the original release, and holy smokes, <laughs> the UI changed so drastically. <laughs> yeah. Well, it used to be that your grab meter was just this pink circle that would <laughs> all, like, just continuously grow larger. And you could actually get it to pretty comical proportions where it ended up taking up like half the screen if you beat the game like several times. <laughs> oh, God. But they changed that in this one by adding the little the bar. bar that sticks out from the left. And so <laughs> hmm. at least uh, looks a little. Yeah. They definitely went better. with the more adding to, more, to the minimalisticness that the game already has and just minimizing the UI. Yeah. Just... Yeah, they definitely cleaned it up and gave it a modern retouch. And and on that note, I just want to quickly talk about the, the logo and the cover art for this game. If you compare the new one to the old one, I think the new one is just so much better. Especially the title screen of the game, too. The title screen of the original is, is nowhere near as nice as the remake. Hmm. The logo type for the original looks like some like uh, word art, like MS uh, really? word, <laughs> word art. Like... I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> yeah, you, you <laughs> no, should honestly great. Google the original like just title screen of Shadow of the Colossus, or, like main menu. It's not great. If you want to see some bloom, <laughs> you can check out <laughs> that shit. I actually did want to talk about the uh, design in terms of presentation, the design of the actual Colossi themselves, because I think that's something we haven't really touched on. 
because uh, I think they really are quite unique. They they don't really share elements with many other games that I've played even since then, or since the game released originally. Just sort of the art direction they went with it, with the uh, sort of living creatures that are almost encased in the stone or metal armor with you know strange features and i think it's it's quite unique to this game but otherwise i think actually quite a few of them share a lot of stylistic elements with each other which can get a bit samey but out yeah, of there all are of them, three like humanoid ones that uh, have very similar models. I think the first, the sixth, and the fifteenth. There. Yeah, to me, it was more the uh, repetition of the brown fur, which is climbable, and uh, sort of stone features being uh, sort of safe points to rest on. You know that that's absolutely uh, unique and beautiful in terms of design, but it did get samey. So in that case, I actually found the seventh uh, Colossus Hydrus and the twelfth. The yeah, the the eel. Uh, those were actually the two most visually interesting I found because the eel had those uh, electric barbs, which were absolutely Tins. incredibly uh, beautiful to look at with the colors and the contrast to the environment and how it manages to uh, communicate how the eel was moving underwater. Mm -hmm. Also, it triggered my thalassophobia a bit, so that was <laughs> a fun fight. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think there's definitely a good variety in the shapes and, and the designs of most of them, as you were saying. Um, they definitely represent quite a few different, like, recognizable creatures, like the eel or the bird or uh, the, like lion the gecko or, or the lion. lion. Yeah. Or even the 13th, so, whatever that sky worm is. Fair yeah. Nice. I think, yeah, they do share very similar designs and similar color palettes, but I think it was good that they had a very unifying uh, sort of palette and, and design aesthetic to show to you that they are all of the same creation, I suppose. That's true, yeah. And then you get to, like, the last one, which is, like, this black tower. <laughs> I think it just might have been kind of dark. Yeah, it's <laughs> just <laughs> raining dark. I mean, I interpret it as like, oh, this is like black. But, no, you're right. That is how it's presented for him to be darker than the yeah, rest. He's high contrast flames. I also want to point out, I thought the animation is really good because there's two, two of the smaller ones, like, like the cat and the dog, that, you know, maybe when I was younger, I didn't quite, you know, are they both cats? Are they both dogs? Whatever. But now when I look at it and I played it through recently, you can definitely tell by the animations that the one is... Uh, the 11th is the cat, and the, what, what is it, the 13th? 14th. 14th, sorry. Man, I can't get any of these, right? I'm always off by <laughs> one. Anyways, is a dog. And you can see that just by the way that they posture, even. The way that the the 11th stalks you, and the way that uh, uh, the, oh my god, I already forgot it was 14th. It the 13th. 14th, oh my god. <laughs> I tried to go back to 13 again. <laughs> Anyways, the point being that, <laughs> that just the animations and the way that the creatures move around is, is really cool. You could you could tell that even though the, the basic shapes of these creatures are, are similar, the, the animations that they put to them gave it so much characteristics that I could, I could tell between uh, this one's clearly supposed to be a cat, this one's clearly supposed to be a dog, and I thought that was really neat. Hmm. Yeah, there's an there's insane level of care and, and polish that I think that went into each of them to kind of bring them to life and, and make them their, their own character, effectively. And it definitely helps that this is you know, maybe a five or six hour game with only one gameplay system, really, or one gameplay objective. Loop. Yeah. One loop, yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, it's not something that's feasible for like a 50 hour game like Skyrim to, uh, you know, employ all these high level animations on this scale. Uh, but it is interesting to notice that, or to note that the animations on the flying colossi number five and number 13 are are incredible and mm -hmm. absolutely yep. blow something like skyrim's dragons out of the water <laughs> you know, yeah. is the, uh, I'm pretty and, you know that came out six probable. years later <laughs> but you know different different constraints on skyrim obviously so different priorities yeah it's just run on top of the colossi i definitely like how each of them had the, like kind of similar 
but also different battle theme to each of their the fights. Music. Yeah, and like it's really nice like when you're like in the thick of it, like you get this really like uplifting, you know, soundtrack. But then like heroic. once you yeah, yeah, very heroic. And then right at the end, like after you beat it, it's like this very mellow, very sad, like like you had yeah, to take this life. And then it's like, another uh, subversion of the heroic ending music trope from other <laughs> yeah, Nintendo related <laughs> adventure games. Other adventure games where you play a guy with a sword on a horseback. The games uh, that yeah, shall not be game. named. <laughs> we get all this fanfare when you beat a boss, and then this game is like, nah, nah. Yeah, it's trying to make you feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. I will say it's really good when it works. And when it works, it really works. But when it doesn't work, eh. When I was fighting the fifth one, there is a way that you can... I was trying to play around with climbing onto his hand before you have him mash down the barriers before you can get to the wall and, you know, proceed with the fight the way you're supposed to. Is You can climb onto his hand because there's actually hair on it. And he kind of shakes you around. And I was thinking... Well, maybe I can use up momentum to just kind of fly up to his head. But every time that you climb onto his hand, it goes from the, the regular music to the like the soaring yeah, triumphant yeah. music. And then like I fall off and then it goes back. Like, uh. And then it's like every 10 seconds there's a, a music change and it goes to <laughs> it goes to the, the theme that everybody knows, which is great and memorable. But like man, when you hear it come on and off every 10 seconds, it's super yeah. ruins any atmosphere the fight could ever possibly hope to have. Yeah, Definitely absolutely. the musical transitions in the fights was a little transparent. Uh, I know when I was fighting the Gecko, which I don't recall the number on that one, maybe seven or eight, but um, whenever you knock uh, it off the eight. wall, yeah, eight. Uh, whenever you knock it off the wall, like instantly you'll hear like the change in the music tracks like very distinctly, which I think there should have been a little bit of mixing there to make it a little less obvious. Yeah. I will admit, I got to a point where I was actually, I just put on an audiobook because I was like, hey, I just want to get through these glasses. <laughs> that's, uh, wow. I you never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the this game is like people, man. a masterpiece to my guy. I had the TV up loud enough that like I would like occasionally pause the audiobook. Wait, so you had the music <laughs> on and the audiobook, right? Yeah, like I just had the TV going and then like I had the audiobook. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, there's points where I don't like. Know, I would, uh... Like when I was like getting to it, like I, just, I was just focusing on more of the game than the audiobook. I was like, okay, must like consume media. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, awesome. in terms of the actual sound, the songs, the music, um, I think individually all the tracks are absolutely great. I think some of them can be a bit homogenous, but overall, it's a it's definitely an enjoyable soundtrack that really elevates whatever you're doing at the time it's playing but the thing i found and obviously it's obvious aside from the uh transition and songs being a bit uh janky um was when you're not in a fight with a colossus there is no music which yeah. you know clearly in touch was why i was listening to it on your book. especially when you're <laughs> writing argo from like point a to point b it's like okay i'm just gonna listen to something yeah so i mean it, you know it's obviously a design choice to have the world feel a bit more sterile yeah but at the same time after five hours of playing i would have liked little motifs or something to just go during these sort of five ten minute rides across the overworld even yeah, if they, they were hit you small. with some sorrowful piano notes while you're going mm. yeah, what what, what some game has ever done that uh, <laughs> oh i don't know yeah, <laughs> someone must know something <laughs> legend of legend of, i think it's legend of link i think that's Zor the... zordo legend of zordo legend <laughs> of zordon i think it's a power <laughs> yeah oh, it's probably, yeah who knows something like that okay. wow yeah. Sacrilege, <laughs> Zordon of Power Ranger. Okay. <laughs> I also really like, uh, for what little dialogue there is in the game, uh, it's really interesting to me that they chose to use a made up language that doesn't actually exist. I yeah, mean, that actually caught me off guard at the beginning. Like, I was yeah, trying to figure too. out if this, if I'm going, if I'm having a seizure yeah, or, or like Japanese. a stroke. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm not watching a whole lot of anime right now, but I mean, this doesn't <laughs> sound like Japanese. Well, no, it. Because a lot of fake languages often take aspects from real languages to make them sound more familiar. Right. And this, you know, clearly the original game was made by a Japanese developer and the fake language takes a lot of aspects of Japanese and, uh, you know, Asian speech to create this fantasy uh, language. 
So oftentimes it sounds like something that would be from that area of the world, for, you know, by obviously people who don't understand it themselves. So it's like someone who doesn't understand English listening to a made up English. You know, it's, is it English? You can't tell because you don't really know. But there's aspects of the sounds that are very common in that language. Yeah, like it yeah. definitely had that like similar speech pattern of the Japanese language, like how you, you know, say words and well just the order of the word (laughs) (laughs) but definitely (laughs) definitely it's notable like when dorman introduces himself and just the way that dorman says it sounds i I can't really describe it better than that but yeah just the ordering of the words like he puts his name at the end of the sentence and the subtitles put it at the front i don't know it's just (laughs) you can tell that it's not the next foe is xyz something something but like how they well i think it also helps to mask it a bit with just how difficult it is to understand any like the actual sound that dorman makes yeah uh, which by the way i I really love dorman's voice or the way yeah. that they composed it which yeah the mix uh, of has both the, the male and female yeah and they're kind of out of sync almost uh, yeah which kind of sounds yeah. both demonic and angelic almost yeah, yeah. Oh, one of my favorite, favorite hollow things. ring yeah, one of my favorite effects from their speech is actually when they start speaking after you finish a colossus and you get that sort of choppy bit where and then yeah. they start speaking. Yeah, you can hear it start to like echo in almost. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool effect. Yeah, it's like it's clearly unnatural in some way or not of the uh, that world. Uh, otherworldly. One thing I will say that I thought this game it hits sometimes but it misses on others is I feel like there should have been more opportunities for big like set pieces. Like if you were to redo the game from scratch right now, I feel like like Perry mentioned how the animation on the flying colossi are amazing. And I think those ones really take the cake for me. Like when you're riding on the the thirteenth Colossus and it kind of does like a barrel roll in the oh, sky yeah. and you're hanging on and you're flying around through this uh like almost like not quite a sandstorm, but the sand's kind of kicking up and the music is going. I think that's when the Shadow of the Colossus really hits its high notes. It it it's pleasing all the senses, right? You have the amazing <laughs> score, you have the amazing vis- visuals, and you, you know, as much you have as much of the gameplay as you can be offered <laughs> at that at that moment, right? When Hold it, on to it's trying points. to throw you off. Yeah. It's just, that is a great moment. Or when the fifth one comes and swoops down and you have to like jump and grab onto it the front of it. Like oh, those are the, the coolest moments in the game. And I feel like if you were to remake this game, you could just continuously innovate all the colossi to to have an amazing feel like that then this game would be like absolutely the masterpiece that people claim it as well maybe that's probably part of what made it so astounding back when it came out right absolutely i think the spectacle it was unmatched at the time yeah i mean clearly like you're saying that the two flying ones are the obvious uh, examples of that i think it's more of a constraint of how much you know, how dynamic they can make an uh, encounter with one of these if it's a large, heavy, well, ground based thing. I mean, one thing they could have done, like with the gecko, I, whichever one that was, is instead of just being inside, Eight? like whether you could ride it up the wall and try and like hold on while it's mm. scaling. And right. You know, but otherwise, I mean, the giant humanoids, you know, they can't do barrel, you know, maybe somersaults, but that would get complicated. <laughs> combat roll while you're on them. <laughs> A little bit of cartwheel. But there are some changes that they can make. I feel like if they made a seventh one, the uh, the eel, if they made, like, when you're holding on and it goes underwater, it's kind of like a cool, creepy moment. But if they made it, if you go deep and it gets really dark, and then if you were to, like, come up all of a sudden and then it would go faster and you're kind of going in and out of the water really quickly, just to kind of make it a little bit more tense, I feel like they could have added some extra atmosphere with that. And maybe it just comes down to a constraint. Well, maybe not. I mean, they were managing to do stuff with the flying ones. So I don't know. Maybe in Shadow of the Colossus 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no way. I mean, you could ask if Shadow of the Colossus is so good, why isn't there a Shadow of the Colossus 2? But then you <laughs> oh, got to realize that they remade it twice. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I can't wait for them to remake it again for PS5. Hey, let's go. And the controls will still suck. <laughs> I mean, obviously, all the budget's going to go to triangles, right? Exactly. <laughs> I was going to say. I got to have me try my triangles. I have my triangles.
All right, well, I think that's enough of that. Maybe it's time to move on to the uh, question round. Um, so we'll start with Mark, and uh, sure. this is a big question. Um, Ooh, so obviously this is the first time you played this uh, just recently, and obviously it's a game that has a lot of hype surrounding it and people calling it a masterpiece left and right. Um, so did it live up to any of that hype for you? Um, I will say, when I first started playing it, it did not. <laughs> It wasn't until like I guess near the end that I can't like seeing it from a broader perspective, like from a story aspect and from a presentation aspect, like definitely if they only hit its mark, but then the game just falls short when it came to the overall gameplay. And I mean, I guess it didn't help that you were I'm gonna throw you a bit under the bus here, Perry, but when you overhyped it <laughs> here and there to me, I was like, Oh boy, like I knew exact exactly nothing about the game going in. Right. And then it's like... Yeah, that's probably fair. Yeah, and like coming but, out... It's like, I mean, okay. I do love this game, so... I know. I can say whatever <laughs> and, I want. And I, and, I can <laughs> <laughs> and I can see why you love this game, and I can appreciate your opinions on this game. You dare Thanks, challenge man. my nostalgia? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that, Mark, the way that the order in which you disliked and then became sort of more attached to it as you played was the opposite for me, where I was very engaged and sort of engrossed in the idea of the story at the beginning and for the first half of the game, because it was, you know, it's very compelling, it's unique, it's interesting, it's mysterious. And for me, it was the longer it went on. And the more and more I realized closer to the end that there wasn't going to be any change that it sort of lost the uh, that masterpiece status for me. <laughs> so it's a masterpiece at what, like two hours in? <laughs> I don't know, say that a five hour run. game wears out well, as well yeah, no, pretty if, quick. If it, <laughs> if it went from two hours in, like the fifth Colossus or the sixth Colossus into the ending sequence cutscene, then mm, beautiful game. Hmm, I wonder if it wouldn't just be too short-lived at that point. Yeah, no, definitely, obviously, it would be a bit uh, <laughs> cut short. But yeah. I think for then me, we'd all be talking yeah. about how, like, ah, it's a pretty cool game, but I just wish there Should've was been more. Long, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think for me, it's the uh, missed potential that they could have, that seems to be there for the second half. Yeah, that point, it's like, okay, let's 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 pick up the place. Let's go knock over some Colossa and just. Well, just realizing that it's just going to be the same thing for another eight or six Colossus. Yeah, I guess that was enough a decade and a half ago. Simpler <laughs> times. Simpler times. We were we haven't been spoiled by other games of the recent decades. All right. Um. So, Cam, um, do you think that the developers should have made the controls more responsive, and do you think this would have a positive or negative impact on the overall presentation of it? Oh boy, you want my opinion on the controls? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for me, I'm definitely kind of the kind of person who really enjoys tight controls like the 3D Mario games, like Sunshine. I love Sunshine. Uh, even back when it came out and I was playing it when it was brand new, I really loved how tight that game was and how you could do the the back jump where you flick the stick really quick and you, and you do the the heightened jump and like the quick inputs you have to have melee is my favorite smash game right i really appreciate when the game allows me to put inputs in at a quick and precise moment and then be rewarded for it so when this game comes along and there's hardly any inputs and the inputs are generally misguided unclear and generally sloppy and hard to control yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say I'm all about it. I will say, look, I understand what they were trying to go for. And one thing we didn't really mention when we were talking about presentation is how the camera kind of zooms to different cinematic angles and it looks great, right? But it it generally doesn't service the actual gameplay itself. And yeah, until you're trying to see something you need to see. Mm -hmm. Like one thing that comes to mind is like when you're climbing on uh, the 16th Colossus's first hand, if you let the camera go on its own it shows you just its hand it's like okay but i like i need to see other things <laughs> and then get... when you try to jump away he'll like kind of move his arm and like oh wait i'm still floating <laughs> down i go <laughs> and then so i understand yeah. what they're trying to go for maybe they're trying to give some weight to the controls but they didn't really nail that it doesn't feel weighty it feels floaty it almost has the opposite of what maybe they were trying to go for well 
I see it. I definitely understand the frustration because, you know, I've felt it myself as well. Um, but I, I do have to wonder if it wouldn't hurt the presentation a little bit if it didn't feel like more of an actual struggle to defeat the Colossi. Like if you never fell off and you just climbed onto them once and then you just stabbed them over and over and they died, I just don't think it would be as satisfying. No, I agree. And that's why that needs to be fixed alongside of changing the Colossi to do more to get you off of them, right? Besides just shaking you yeah, off. I, so, I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I want there, you can have tight controls, but there need to be challenges for you to face with the tight controls. Yeah, because as, as it stands, as we seem to be saying, is that the controls are the greatest challenge in beating a Colossus, not the actual uh, <laughs> challenge the Colossus attempts to present itself. Yeah, well, and I will agree with you to some extent, Perry, like as much as I hate the jump, the, like the first couple of times when like you leap off of something like flying towards a Colossi and Juan is just kind of like flailing his arms around <laughs> and then you like you catch on to it and you hold on and you kind of get this like jerking feeling. It's like that that can be special. But as Evan said, it kind of wears out its welcome. And then just other things like when you have your sword up and it's pointing the direction, why is there a delay after you put it down. Like there's a couple second delay where it locks you out of the controls. It's like, why? I'm just trying to know where I'm going. I'm not proud that I put my sword up, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to admire it. Let's just go. Yeah, in terms of the actual sort of, you know, the feel of a struggle against the Colossus, I, I'd say it almost feels like they wanted you to feel ragdolled against these giant imposing creatures, which, you know, seems reasonable. Uh, the problem is that you don't, you never, you almost never feel ragdolled when you're being shaken around or anything, because all you have to do is hold a uh, trigger button and you're still on there as long as you don't run out of stamina. It looks like uh, a mild inconvenience. Yeah, and it's more you feel ragdolled due to, uh, you know, s slippery physics or your own you know, inputs missing something and then getting or being perma stunned or stuff like that that's when the ragdoll really starts to feel like that's what they were going for and it's not a good feeling for it yeah i mean again it's the kind of conversation of their intent of what it was supposed to feel like versus how it actually ended up feeling and what that kind of ended up getting across to the players yeah, yeah. which well, was you sacrifice playability for yeah well you can sacrifice playability for you know certain presentation things but when the presentation things like aren't that great you know you all you've done is sacrificed gameplay yeah um so last question for evan and so why do you think this game has lasted so long in the gaming discourse and you know gotten two remasters like are there any lessons that developers can learn from it well i think that you know, like we've been saying, people consider it a masterpiece and there's absolutely elements of the game that are entirely unique and sort of special and different compared to a lot of others then and now. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's, it's, it's the unique elements aside from the struggles of the game that I think make people remember it. Because who knows, for, you know, this is my first time playing. A year from now, am I going to remember the frustration with the controls and you know, sluggish stuff and things like that? Or am I going to remember the intro sequence and the uh, ending sequence and the music? Like, is that the bit that I'm going to remember and base my uh, feelings on later? And in, if that's the case, then absolutely. It would still be something that I'd uh, think fondly of. But as a whole, I'm not sure that it's the masterpiece people say it is but in terms of you know what devs can learn from it and have learned from it i think that it's kind of tough because a lot of the unique aspects of the game are very divisive as we have seen here with the uh clunkier controls and things like that and the way the horse controls and uh the lack of content aside from the colossus you know these are all very unique to this game but it's not necessarily stuff that devs would want to add to their own in the future and i mean i would argue that this is probably the first game that really employs climbing and you know maybe this is maybe developers were inspired by this and we got assassin's creed and 
Uncharted and all those out of this sudden excitement of just the verticality and the aspect of climbing in games, but ended up changing it up to make it feel different for whatever reason. So clearly there's a lot of lessons to learn from the game. I think many devs have taken examples from it and incorporated it in their own way, but overall it's a very unique game and that's probably why it's still relevant today. Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely, I think, the uniqueness uniqueness of the setting and the gameplay was really fresh at the time for a lot of people. And as you said, I think it was really just how was this game remembered by most people was with the spectacle and the swelling score and less with the frustrations of the controls, which <laughs> uh, I think was very much my experience with it. Because, you know, years later, I couldn't even remember battle and grappling with the controls at all. But... <laughs> Um, the one thing you didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> everyone has to find out for himself. <laughs> um, but as for, I mean, I guess that was a bit of a two-parter there, but um, as for what devs could learn, I think one of the best things that this game shows is that sometimes less is more. And this game has very few systems, very few loops in it, um, but they've just been so highly polished. And it's just the presentations of the highest quality. Now, obviously, a product like this is, I can see how creatively it's a huge gamble for a company to, you know, pour this amount of effort into what only ends up being a five or six hour experience. And then, you know, what if people don't like it? What if it's not good? Um, And, you know, not every company can have Team Eco's dev time of nine years to make The Last (laughs) Guardian, for example, (laughs) you know. But it does show that a small game can still be an excellent game, I think. Absolutely. In my opinion. <laughs> I'd like to juxtapose Shadow of the Colossus up against games like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, where you literally have to pay them money to not play the game and progress <laughs> through it, right? Yeah. So I think you could definitely can see where we've gone from this short, sweet, and beautiful to games with just so much, bleh, just so much extra fluff thrown into them. Yeah, I well, think I there's point definitely to a middle one of the somewhere. most popular, like I guess, walking simulators as people call them uh, these days, um, like Firewatch or What Remains of Edith Finch, is very much the the short but sweet kind of mentality. It's you know each of them is maybe only two to four hours long, but they're you know memorable experiences in their own right, and I think most people speak pretty fondly of both of them. Yeah, I think it seems to be a split between. If, if a game has been created for a narrative sort of focus, you know, as walking simulators tend to be, it's, it's to progress a narrative and there's not necessarily that much interaction involved. And I'd say that Shadow of the Colossus is probably the same. The gameplay is fairly simple and shallow. Uh, and what you could call the narrative, whether it's the uh, interactions with Colossus, and whether it's the, uh, you know, the beginning and the ending, I think that is clearly the focus where it's it's about the overall experience and getting from the beginning of the his of wander's story to the end of it like the game definitely sets us up as like a uh i guess as an art piece and yeah like, absolutely like directors like gamero de toro i'm pretty sure i blocked his name but like i'm pretty sure like he has taken an influence influence from shadow Colossus and uses it in some of his films. Are we saying that Guillermo del Toro has played Shadow of the Colossus? And... It seems possible. Well, yeah. Did you see Pacific Rim? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He and played like... Shadow of the Colossus, and I was like, what if robots? <laughs> and then there you go. Well, no, isn't that because he watched Evangelion and he's best friend with the <laughs> director? <of> I mean, <laughs> possible. <laughs> and he's like, what if American? <laughs> <laughs> yeah like it definitely lets us up to like other industries and how like i can't i remember i was watching another like analysis type video on shadow colossus like earlier today and i think uh they actually played the game in one of the movies and i can't remember oh which. yeah it's the one with nicholas cage can't remember really the name of it <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's why it's forgettable and like uh <laughs> Rain then, Over Me, I think it's called? I think so. And essentially, the purpose of Shadow Colossus in that movie was that it was a way for the main character to go through his depression, I think, 
I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was actually it mirrored the story of Shadow of the Colossus yeah. in in a way, where I think like the main character lost like a loved one, and so and, like this is uh, this was his somehow way used to it. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm actually just kind of curious uh, in a very simple sense of now I know I'm fairly sure that I know what Perry thinks of the game, but. I'm curious what Cam and Mark think, <laughs> like whether you guys like the game or whether it's... Uh... Well, you know, me being the other nostalgia boy here. <laughs> <laughs> so for my, if I were to like encompass my thoughts on this game, it's kind, of, it's kind of a battle between when I experienced this game first and all the nostalgia I have, as you would probably expect, and all the gripes I have with it now. And Perry's kind of right to a sense where I don't remember, I remember falling off Colossus a lot, but I don't remember that being from janky controls. I remember that being more from not having enough stamina. So, I mean, it, it's it's a really sweet memory, but now when I play it again, it's like, I love seeing it in this updated graphics format, but like, it's almost, some parts are either just boring or like parts of the, the 16th Colossus are just unplayable. Like when you have to go from the first hand, you run up his arm to his bicep and then go to the second hand, and there's like no indication that like I found out this after I beaten this boss twice by just trying to jump from his second hand onto his collar and then run up his head. I, I Google the speed run. And what you're actually supposed to do is climb onto the back of his hand stab where there is clearly no indication of a stab point where in every other boss, a stab point is always even that boss. You can see it on his back. He's got like a blue glowy bit that you're supposed to stab. But anyway, you're supposed to stab the back of his hand and then shoot an arrow to his uh, to his shoulder and then get up there it's like just there's certain things like that that just accumulate to just make this game like really frustrating and annoying to play so while i still enjoyed my most recent playthrough through it i like it definitely ruined parts of it for me and i i'd probably hard to give it a, a grade it's, it's sitting probably somewhere around like a three out of five or like a 65 percent. like it's still good it has a lot to it but i mean like the, the core game by now standards is just not good what about you, Mark? Yeah, kind of going off of Cameron's point, like I definitely share similar thoughts, but coming from like a new player's perspective, like in c comparing this game to like like newer titles, and like it definitely makes me wish like I kind of played this game way back when compared to playing other games. I'm pretty sure I was playing World of Warcraft at the time. <laughs> Still am, but uh, yeah, like I overall, it was a it was okay. I think it was a it was a solid game from like a presentation and then like a story or lack of story perspective but then it just falls short in my mind when the game of it from a gameplay and like it definitely could have been especially because like this is a remake and they could have you know made things a lot i guess more modern i know like at one point i was just shifting to the the settings and like looking back at the classic control scheme i was like eh, i'm just gonna to the modern control scheme. And what's uh, your opinion on it then, Evan? I think for me, the uh, some sort of the key sentence for how I think of it is I really want to like it more than I actually do. I absolutely love the idea of it, the concepts, the sort of story beats that are there, and the atmosphere and uniqueness of the designs and the ideas of battling these giant colossus colossi and uh, <laughs> I, I i really want to like it and for you know a bit over half of the game that's how i felt but like i've said the longer i went the less happy i was with it so i don't know maybe the problem is i played it too quickly like Maybe if I spread it out over a longer period of time, it would feel more fresh every time I go to fight a new Colossus, and that might have changed my opinion on it. But as it stands now, it's an interesting experience that I'd probably recommend to someone to try, but with a... A big old asterisk? Yeah, stating <laughs> like, you know, this it's not akin to any other current generation game it's it's very unique in its ideas of how it uh is designed and controlled and sort of to be ready for some frustration that's funny that you should say that because even though like i obviously just shit on it a bit there 
I actually too would recommend it to pretty well everyone. I think everybody should play Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah, that's the thing. It's an interesting experience. It's very yeah. unique. And its high points are lofty and high. So you just play through it once and then... Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like something I think most people could or should play through at least once. And uh, even just to mention quickly, it's not even the kind of game that you're meant to play more than once. Like I've played it maybe only three times ever. Unless you want all the trophies and all that jazz. Well, yeah, but like, <laughs> I don't know. To That's experience the story. Mm. Yeah. I would say I did get some added value this time around where you kind of get to notice things about, like how I was talking about the the, the Shadow of the Colossus flowchart to beating Colossi. It's kind of <laughs> notice. It's kind of nice noticing like some of the game design elements they put in. But I mean, that's just a neat thing and it doesn't really warrant coming back and playing it a million times. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you, actually, it's a good point. Even as a study of how games are designed, it's absolutely worth it in that regard because mm-hmm. it's so different than many others. Yeah. Well, just to give, I guess, my final thoughts on it. I mean, yeah, you guys all know I love this game. but And I mean, admittedly, I have a lot of nostalgia for it. And I'll, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that for sure. Like, I, you know, I played it when I was probably like 12 on a friend's PS2, like, <laughs> uh, you know, with no internet help or anything like that. And it was a very, like, very pure gaming experience and i mean anyway aside from all that um i do think it stands the test of time in a, in a certain way like we've all said already like it's it's something that we would recommend to people just to to try it out because it's not like other games you can't get this experience elsewhere but uh, i mean yeah it can be frustrating at times but for me uh, definitely the, the the package here the the whole package i find to be greater than the sum of its parts um, and I mean, I appreciate the compact story and the compact gameplay, and yeah, I think it's something worth checking out just for the experience. Ten out of ten, <laughs> million out of ten. <laughs> Hear me out. Four thousand out of ten. Shadow of the Colossus, but VR. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, <laughs> are you trying? To... I uh, I said it couldn't be done, but Mark has found a way to make the controls even worse. <laughs> 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 that sounds like a good way to get motion six. <laughs> yeah. Especially anyway, <laughs> I think I think that's going to be everything for us for this episode. Um, so you can tune in next episode where we're going to be switching gears considerably. We're going to be discussing XCOM Enemy Unknown along with uh, the Enemy Within expansion. Uh, so thanks for listening. This is Game Dive. Hey everyone, this is Perry. Thanks for listening to Game Dive. Make sure to join in on the discussion below and let us know what your thoughts are about the game. And if you enjoyed the discussion, you can drop us a like. Game Dive is a bi-weekly podcast, so be sure to subscribe and check back every other Tuesday for a brand new episode.